Okay, all right. We're gonna go ahead and get started. All right, hello, Holsabo. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to everybody to Beer with a Scientist. So my name is Levi Beverly. I'm a cancer researcher at the Brown Cancer Center, associate professor at University of Louisville. Uh, I've been running the Beer with a Scientist since 2014. Uh, I have to say this is one of the bigger crowds that we've had, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much here. Uh, I'll say if anybody needs chairs, I would just say if, ask, fill in some spots here and there if you, if you want. Um, so basically a, little, a couple pieces of housekeeping information before we get started. Uh, Dr. Friedland will be hanging around after the talk. If you're interested to buy a copy of his book, uh, he'll sign it for you, personalize it. Probably worth millions of dollars one day, so you might want to get in on that. Uh, so one thing I, I should say is that uh, I run this... Uh, I don't get anything out of it, so I'm just here having a fun time, drinking some beer, learning some science, just like you guys are, so I appreciate it. But who is here uh, to make money is Olivia behind the bar. I will say she got married on Tuesday, so maybe throw an extra $5 in her bucket or something. Uh, she married Andrew, who's also an employee here at Whole Sopel, so we wish them the best. Uh, uh, like I said, we'll have been here for a couple hours probably by the time we're all done, said and done, so uh, make sure you take care of her because she's taking care of us. Uh, so what's going to happen here is it's uh, going to be about a 30-minute talk. Uh, as you can see, there's no screen today, which is kind of abnormal for me. I was in the middle of setting the screen up, and Dr. Friedland said, I don't need, any, I don't need to project anything. And I said, well, good. One less thing I have to worry about then. Um, one other, uh, just a, shout, uh, a thing to throw out there is we, uh, I run also a trivia night every other month here at Holsopel, and all of the proceeds from trivia night go to different charities next Wednesday. At 7 o'clock is trivia night here. Uh, all the proceeds this time go to a charity called Options for Individuals. They help people with mental and physical uh, uh, difficulties in the workplace and uh, to help them acclimate into the community. Okay, I think that's all. And again, this is a bar, this is a, a brewery, so at any time if you need to get up and get a beer, go ahead. Don't, you're not going to hurt anybody's feelings. So, um, <laughs> Lastly, uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the speaker then. So it's my absolute pleasure today to introduce Dr. Robert Friedland. Uh, he is a actual personal friend of mine. I don't get to introduce personal friends very often. Um, he's a collaborator and a colleague. We've actually published at least three papers together now. Uh, about 2018, um, Dr. Friedland had a couple people working in his lab and they needed a new home, as it were. So uh, they came and they worked in my laboratory space was a, a great experience. We had joint lab meetings with his laboratory. Uh, we learned a lot from Dr. Friedland. Uh, his day job is a neurologist, which I don't think he's going to talk too much about today, but he's become quite an expert in the microbiome and how your microbiome in the gut affects brain functions, especially neurodegenerative disorders. In fact, the most recent paper that we published together, uh, where it was all Dr. Friedland, for the most part, uh, his ideas. Um, but we were able to show that the microbiome in the gut can actually accelerate ALS, a type of neurodegenerative disorder. So that was kind of a, a really cool paper to be involved in. Um, he has given one other beer of the scientists, but that was many a year ago when we were actually at Against the Grain. And uh, he actually almost sent all of his people to Against the Grain tonight instead of uh, Whole Sopple. <laughs> so we're glad everybody he invited showed up at the right place tonight. Um, without further ado, I think, please welcome Dr. Friedland up to the stage. Thank you, Levi. I want I want to thank Levi for this opportunity and for the uh, chance to collaborate together for so many years. Um, and I thank Carmichael's bookstore who have uh, bought the books which are available for sale. And um, 
Also, I don't want to forget to uh, thank Mira and Kathy, who are helping with uh, the sales, which is not in their job descriptions. <laughs> and uh, also, before I forget, whatever I say today about lifestyle activities, you should discuss with your doctor before you do something. <laughs> that doesn't mean you have to agree with them. <laughs> I also want to thank uh, Louis Pasteur for his contribution. <laughs> Uh, he showed us that fermentation was not only a chemical phenomenon, it was biological. And uh, I have a disclosure. That is, uh, I'm very interested in evolution. Uh, human evolution is in involved in everything we do, uh, everything we can do, everything that is interesting to us, and particularly aging. And I'll explain how understanding of aging helps us to deal with, uh, understanding evolution can help us to deal with aging. The, the idea is, on many levels, involving diet, physical and mental activities, injuries, psychological, physical, social, and cognitive factors. They all have evolutionary aspects. The, the best way perhaps to, to get started considering evolution is a story which uh, I'm not sure if the number we're going to give you is correct, but it's just a concept is that there's a man, there's somebody knocking on your door. You open the door and there is your mother. Behind her is her mother, your grandmother. Behind her is your great-grandmother. And behind her are all the mothers for five miles of mothers. That's called the mother of all lines. <laughs> but I'm told, and I don't know if uh, Professor Guillermo will tell us later, but I was told this would be five million years of human evolution and about five million years ago, our common ancestor was similar to a chimp. Not, not the same, but common ancestor who became chimps and also became humans. But the, the fact is, this is um, really important. Evolution involves each one of us. It's not just something in science, like always an idea, or um, I don't know, I'd like to go to Italy, or I don't know, I don't know a comparable idea. It's, just a th it's not just a thought, right? We are primates. And there's nothing about us which is there are impressive things that we can do because we have better, bigger brains than non-human primates, but we are, we are. So this explains so many things about, about human aging. One thing is um, evolution has designed the human head so that it's protected from multiple blows from, to the head. So multiple blows to the head can be protected, so the brain is protected, so it's not injured by multiple blows. This is true for woodpeckers. <laughs> it's not true for humans. We're not protected from... Playing football is bad for the brain, and uh, I think um, children should not play football, or college students should not play football, but that's another talk for another, really, the scientist. But evolution has not protected us against this, so it's not good to get rep repetitive traumas to the brain. Also, our ancestors, more recently than our common chimp ancestor, maybe 150 to 100,000 years ago when humans, hominids were evolving, we couldn't eat sweets all the time because there was nothing that was that sweet that you could eat in large quantities. So we... Uh, evolve the capacity for liking eating sweets because it's a good thing to eat things that are sweet because they have more calories. However, we don't have a, we haven't evolved the capacity for not eating too much because that n didn't happen in the past. Um, the cow, cows have about five times more fat than game 
And our ancestors did not eat cows because cows didn't exist. There were buffaloes, and buffaloes would run away and kill you if you, if you weren't <laughs> nice to them. And uh, I, I was shocked to learn that moose have very little saturated fat. I'm not suggesting moose hunting, but if, if, you, had to, if you were forced to eat red meat, moose would be better. But so we evolved at that time 10 to 100,000 years ago when our ancestors were eating a different diet. So we're not prepared by evolution to eat meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Uh, studies of hunter-gatherers who still exist today show they have an extraordinarily diverse diet, which means they eat a lot of different things. This leads to a lot of different bacteria in the gut. And this is related to their health. It's good for your health to have a diverse diet. Our ancestors had a diverse diet because you couldn't put the cheese in the refrigerator. You couldn't um, kill an animal and then eat it slowly over, over six months because you put it in the freezer. And our, uh, and the, the concept is the genes we have were not developed by evolution for this lifestyle. Because how long have we had um, iPhones? You know, 10 years. And then how long have we had, we've only had domesticated animals maybe for 10,000 years, which is not that long. For most of human evolution, we didn't have agriculture. So you couldn't eat uh, corn every day. Diversity of diet is related to diversity of the gut bacteria, which is good for your health. So we evolved here together with these bacteria. Uh, when I say bacteria, I mean bacteria, fungi, and some other organisms, including parasites, that are living inside us. So there are about uh, just as many cells in these bacteria as in our bodies. And there may be a hundred times more DNA information in these bacteria than in ours. So some people have said, we are a holobiont. We're a living thing which is related, which has many parts. And the neat thing about this is that all our ancestors had them all the way back to worms and ants and fish and everything. Because you can't possibly live on Earth without having uh, exposure to bacteria. It said every nervous system that ever existed developed in relation to bacteria somewhere in the animal. We all have about one kilogram of living bacteria in us. And the neat thing, which was not immediately apparent to me. Why should it matter that much? But actually, they evolved with us, and we evolved with them. So it's not possible to have none of them, right? Because they're everywhere. They were going to come in. They evolved the capacity to enhance our ability to tolerate them, because if we attack them, Everybody would have inflammatory bowel disease. We'd all be very sick, and that would be the end of human evolution. So the bacteria had to make sure that we tolerated them for their own survival. Because the more that they made us sick, the less their host would survive, and they'd be finished. So they had the evolutionary force for us to tolerate them. At the same time, if our immune system noticed the bacteria and said, oh God, oh no, ah, <laughs> right? Everybody would have inflammatory bowel disease and would all be dead. So our immune system has a system of controlling the response. The immune system has an inflammatory component and a tolerating component. We need both of them. So if we step on a splinter, we have to have an active inflammatory response to kill the bacteria. But we can't do that with these gut bacteria, so we have to tolerate them. So the more that we have a bacterial community which has the right diversity, 
and the right composition, our immune system is more tolerant. Tolerant of everything, tolerant of foreign antigens, tolerant of our own proteins and molecules. And immunity is a component of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, cancer, heart disease, and stroke. And I didn't mention arthritis, and you can imagine other things. So inflammation is very important. Everybody can do what I call gene therapy in the kitchen. That is, we have more DNA from bacterial genes than human genes. We can alter the bacterial genes by changing our diet. So this led me to think about aging and to think about what we should do about it. And I um, came upon the idea or the question, is aging inevitable? And I first thought, yes, of course, everybody ages, every, everybody has aging, and I, there's, it's, there's literature about this, everybody seems to think, everybody I talk to thinks aging is inevitable. And I think it's not. The reason is because everybody does not get a chance to be old. And the declines with aging are not universal. And if you think about uh, evolution, we're not prepared to be so old because most people died before they were 30 or 40. So to live to be 60 is not something that is built into us because of evolutionary forces. Because 60-year-old people generally don't have any children. Once we've had children and uh, raised the children, there's no genetic evolutionary advantage for having a long life. There's an argument about whether grandparents are good for their grandchildren, but that's another matter. <laughs> especially grandmothers. <laughs> but I think on a personal level, this is important to know. So when you're 20, you're 30, you can, you can stay out late, you can not sleep, you can eat badly, you can drink too much. It's not good for you, but you, you might not suffer that much because you're so well built. Because we're protected by evolution, which is very important that people live long enough to have children. That's the key thing. When you get to be 50, forget it. We're not that well built anymore. <laughs> My, my favorite thought experiment is imagine uh, a, base, a football team of 60-year-old men who play American football, and uh, on every, after every play, there'd be a stretcher, right? And uh, <laughs> Outside the stadium, there'd be a row of al ambulances willing to take people. You know, we, we can't, 60-year-old people can't play football. I, I found that I, at, at 30, I couldn't play basketball anymore. It was too hard on me, my body. Wait, are they playing another team of 60-year-olds? Yes. Because that would be fun to watch, actually. Right. So the reason I think aging is not inevitable is everybody doesn't get to be old. The example is uh, Princess Diana would be the best example, but everybody has their own not Everybody knows people in their family and their friends who never got to be old. So to say aging is in... Uh, Princess Diana was 37. To say aging is inevitable is to imply something that, that doesn't happen all the time. So I, I think about uh, four friends I had in my neurology residency in New York in the 1970s. They all had AIDS, they all had AIDS, and they all died in the 80s because there was no treatment for AIDS in the 80s. And what would they think if we were saying, oh, aging is inevitable, happens to everybody? Well, they didn't get to be 40. So because aging is not inevitable, I think we should consider, it should be considered to be an opportunity. Because there are declines with aging, but they don't happen the same way to everyone. So it's possible that a 60-year-old person who drinks too much, smokes, doesn't eat well, and doesn't exercise, if they do the right thing, which I'll talk about in a moment, they could be in better health when they're 70 than they were when they were 60. Even though there are declines. Every human function declines with aging. Different ways in different people. The most important thing is what increases with aging is variability. So old people are more different 
from other old people, then young people are different from young people. Which means there are older people who are not impaired, whatever the thing might be, muscle mass, speed, cognitive capacity. It doesn't go down in every case. It's possible to maintain relative stability, but this depends on what we do. The best summary of that would be uh, the question of attention. What do we pay attention to? If we pay attention to the fact that uh, my knee hurts, my hip hurts, uh, I miss my dog who died, and um, I'm not working. Uh, if we have depressing thoughts, we'll have depressing life. It, of course, it's not that easy, but to fo it's possible to focus your attention and um, William James has a wonderful story that experience is not what's important, it's attention. He says if you let a pack of dogs loose in the British Museum for one year, they wouldn't learn anything about art. <laughs> and they'd, they'd make a great mess. They would experience the art, they wouldn't have, they're un incapable of paying attention to it. So I devised an idea that what we need is reserves. We need to be resilient. So I asked the question, what are the goals of aging? What should be our goals of aging? Everybody can agree, or I can ask, but uh, I know you'll agree the first goal is not dying. <laughs> I could. Second goal is not being sick, not having disease. You want to get, you want to get to be old. I mean, either you get to be old or you get to be dead. So it's not, right? You want, when you get to be old, you want to be not dead. You want to be, uh, you don't want to have cancer. You don't want to have heart disease. You don't want to have kidney failure, right? That's not enough. You want to be in good shape. You want to be fit. And physical fitness is not enough. Mental fitness is not enough. So what kind of fitness is it? I call this reserves. Reserves are forces that are withheld from battle until they're needed, like later. That's in a military sense. And it's well accepted in my field that a cognitive reserve is important. That is, the state of your brain will determine how affected you are by aging. If you uh, your main activity is watching Seinfeld reruns, <laughs> and you you do enjoy uh, the the gay days when you or the new business with cable. You can actually spend the whole day watching football all year long. <laughs> College football, you can watch Tennessee against Tennessee State, and you know Kansas against Kansas A and M or whatever it is. <laughs> if this is not cognitively enhancing, versus being active, involved in learning throughout life. If, you do, if you're actively involved in learning, your brain will be better. Your brain will be more resistant to what happens. If you have a little stroke or you have some Alzheimer's disease, you'll be relatively resistant to that. That is cognitive reserve. But the point of my book is cognitive reserve is not enough because you also have physical functions, which include the microbiota, psychological and social activities. So there's psychological reserve with the ability to maintain a healthy mental state which is related to social reserve, which is the uh, state of in connections with other people, uh, organizations, and groups. And physical reserve is important, because if your heart function is so poor, it won't be providing enough oxygen and uh, blood to the brain. If your liver is damaged by too much of uh, Louis Pasteur's <laughs> aspect, um, it'll affect your brain. But this is certainly true in regard to disease. So the more cognitive reserve you have, you're protected for getting Alzheimer's. And it also involves resistance. So even if you don't have reserve, you want to be in a state which is resistant. So when I see a patient, let's say I see a 70-year-old man and I see patients as a cognitive or memory disorder neurologist. I see a man who's 70 years old who, and I decided, I find out 
Uh, he's not demented. Not uncommon complaint is he thinks he's forgetting things. I said, well, what is it you forgot? I said, well, uh, what was Nicolas Cage's last movie? <laughs> I said, well, you know, forget it. It's not. It's of no significance. Everybody forgets. <laughs> And this has happened to me. Or a woman said, I don't know, who wrote Wuthering Heights? <laughs> Emily Bronte or uh, that other... Uh, Jane Austen, right. She doesn't... I said, well, that's not a sign of Alzheimer's disease. Because memory is uh, lost in... Well, is impaired with aging. But if this man who's 70 is not demented... I'd say, okay, he's not demented. But he never exercises. He eats meat every day, he smokes, and he drinks three bourbons a day. So I may say to him, did I say this man was 70 years old? Yeah, he's 70 years old. I said, no, I forgot. I said, I'm very sorry, Mr. Jones, your liver is 70 years old. So the ability of his liver to detoxify his alcohol is not as good now as it was when he was 30 or 40 or 50. And I don't, you know, I don't need to do a test. That's just a fact of life. The liver ages like everything else. So his four bourbons could have an effect, more effect on the brain, because the liver is not detoxifying. And we're not even going to talk about the kidneys. It's something else that's also important. So I say I want you to enhance your cognitive, physical, social, and psychological reserves. Actually, I don't say it in that, but this is what I tell them. And I have a list, a handout. Mira will be kind enough to give the handout later. But it has a list of recommendations. So, uh, physical activity is good for the brain. And the, the brain is a living thing which is plastic, which means it changes. So if you... Um, Use your left hand only to hold beer cans. <laughs> your brain is not concerned with the position of the fingers in regard to each other. If you play the cello, the relationship of these two, of the fourth and fifth fingers on your left hand is the key to the sound you make, right? The brain is going to be making more neurons, more connections, more neurotransmitters, more neurotransmitter receptors, and more dendritic complexity, more network for that. But it's a physical thing. It's not only like software. So we enhance the capacity and resilience of the brain by being mentally active. And you may have already heard my, my line that um, crossword puzzles are good. However, recent research shows only the downwards and the crosswords are not good for the brain. <laughs> but I, I have this problem. It's very difficult. You know, people don't. Un if I tell them, if I said I'm a diabetes doctor, you have to take this pill. If you don't take this pill, you're going to die. People understand that. They 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 do their best. Of course, they don't do it perfectly, but at least they know they have to take the pill. I tell them you, you should exercise. So. Humans have been always physically active. 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, somebody who was physically inactive had nothing to eat. Right? They didn't have a refrigerator. They wouldn't have a store. They didn't have a closet to, to keep the noodles. They, they had to go out and do that every day. So everyone was physically active. We don't have genes for being a couch potato. I also think everyone in those days was mentally more mentally active than now. Because now, as I said, you can spend your day watching Seinfeld reruns and you can watch football and you can go shopping once a month and get your, your, hot, your beef burgers and your potato chips. And there's not a lot of cognitive activity in that. But 10,000 years ago, you had to be aware of where, were the, where was the food. Well, don't go that way in this month because that's when the hyenas are really active and they killed my brother-in-law last week. So you got to be, you had to pay attention to this. Now, you know, you don't have to, um, 
You don't have to be that mentally active all the time. You had to be physically active, you had to be mentally active, you had to uh, be careful what you ate. So, uh, an example of this is, uh, I have a foolproof method of detecting what is a mushroom that's safe to eat. And my, my idea is if a mushroom is wrapped in plastic, it's okay. <laughs> But this is, this is a, cognitive act, a cognitive skill I don't have. I, don't, I can't tell. I know that there are bad ones, and I, I'm not going to bother with I'm not ever going to eat a mushroom that I found myself. It's just not worth it. I'm too fond of my liver. <laughs> so uh, the four reserves can help us do better when we get older. And uh, let me see. I am... Looking forward to answering your questions. And uh, I have an example of what happened just yesterday. Uh, meditation can be very valuable for enhancing psychological reserve and cognitive reserve. Because meditation is, is a practice. It's called a practice, but it is a practice of letting go. And we all have our attention is occupied by thoughts about, oh, why did I lose tennis to that guy? Why, when is that IRS agent going to make a decision about my case? <laughs> and meditation is like, is an exercise, it's like lifting weights, but it's with your brain, but your brain is not working at it, you're, it's, it's allowing your brain to recover from all this, all these repetitive thoughts. And uh, sleep is an important part of this also. It's important to get enough sleep and high quality sleep and not drink too much. So to conclude, uh, I was on sabbatical in Japan. My wife speaks Japanese. We met an old man who turns out to be 90 in October by a canal in Kyoto. He's planting something in the ground. And there are other men, older people, planting. And I'm thinking, who plants something in October? And he says, which I got through the translation, you know, these are sakura cherry blossom trees by the canal, which are very beautiful in April or so. He's planting yellow flowers, uh, rape vine flowers, that are going to complement the pink of the cherry blossom. And I, we went back, I saw them in the cherry blossom season. The cherry blossoms are overwhelmingly beautiful, but with the yellow it's like an it's like an outer body experience. It is so magnificent, and this man is 90. So this activity is enhancing his cognitive reserve, because this has a cognitive component. When does he plant it? How deep? How far apart? It's a physical activity because he's busy there on his knees digging in the ground. It's a psychological thing because he's demonstrating or actualizing his meaning in the world. He's 90, his, maybe his children don't call, of course, I don't know, but he's not working. So what meaning does he have in his life? Having a meaning is one of the most, one of the most important psychological concepts that uh, I could imagine. It's important that we, uh, and this is all according to Viktor Frankl, whose book, Man's Search for Meaning, is important to, to read once or twice or three times. But his meaning must be enhanced because people come and see it and they thank him. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because it's a wonderful experience to see these yellow flowers. But it's also a social activity because it involves him and his neighbors. Maybe they fight over who has the seeds. And, but he, he, he's, he, he, he's dealing with his neighbors on a regular basis when he's planting and when he's enjoying the flowers. So that is a way that his activities are enhancing his four multiple reserves. And I had an uh, interaction in clinic yesterday, a 65-year-old woman who has lung cancer. She has some cognitive problems because she's getting chemotherapy, which is basically poisoning her, and she can't remember that well, and that's not surprising. And she's quite weak, she's anemic from the chemotherapy, and she's still smoking. And she said at the end, Oh, Dr. Friedland, I guess this is just what happens when you get old. I didn't say. 
I didn't say this is not what happens when you get old. This is what happens when you don't take care of yourself. So I want everybody to, uh, uh, my patients or actually everybody, to hold my, the concept of the book is we need to take advantage of the opportunities we have because aging is not inevitable. It's an opportunity, opportunity to do this or to do that or to don't, don't do this because what we do affects what happens. And um, uh, a valuable thing, if you ever are wondering what to say about something, look up the word, the most important word in the dictionary, and you find out where it comes from. So I've, I've talked many times about attention, also about opportunity. Opportunity comes from Latin, where, which means having good winds coming into port. That's why there's a port in opportunity. And that's a lovely concept, in my opinion, because aging is kind of coming, coming to port, and we hope that we can have good winds and not bad winds. And at least in the days these words came out, you know, if you didn't have a good wind, you were just stuck there in the port, and you couldn't come to port unless you had a good wind. So I hope everybody will uh, enjoy the beer today, and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions, and hope we all have good wins coming to port. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Friedland. Uh, I will say one thing about his mental, uh, his physical reserves. He told me he walked six miles the other day with a 20 pound sack on his back because he's hiking with a 10 day hike in Italy? In Italy. Italy. In the mountains in Italy uh, next month. So, still active, still mental, still social, still positive. Thank you. All right, so we'll take questions. So is beer good for the microbiome? Repeat the question. Beer is, uh, I'm told that beer is sterile. And so uh, that's a good question. Th thank you. I, I recommend yogurt. Yogurt is really uh, has live bacteria, and it's, everybody seems to agree it's good. However, you don't want sweetness. A, a lot of sugar is not good for your for the microbiota, but yogurt itself. So, and I don't know about kombucha. It's more complicated, and um, kimchi has a lot of salt. Salt is not good either if you have too much, but. Uh, a beer would not be, um, it's recommended by the American Heart Association that men should not have more than two beers a day. And women, one. <laughs> if, you, if you drink too much water, you can die. So let's just take a moderation, okay? Yeah? Question here, Dr. Freeman. Um, in light of Victor Frankl's trauma to himself and the witness of trauma throughout the concentration camp, how did he come to focus on the theme of meaning? Well, thank you. Can you repeat the question? Yes, Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychoanalyst who survived internment in Auschwitz concentration camp. And when he left in 1946, he wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning, that has, was this, judged by the Library of Congress one of the ten most important books of the uh, 20th century, something like that. And he came up with this idea about meaning because he noticed that people who survived and did the best in the camp, of course, most people died, but the ones who did the best were ones who felt there was some meaning in their life that remained after all their suffering. I mean, during all their suffering. They had to be, they had to survive so they could be a witness to what happened. Or they had to be survived because their wife had escaped and, or had not been captured or they wanted to see their wife again. But once they lost that, they quickly died. And this is a critical thing for aging because many people have a job which provides meaning and then they go into retirement and they've lost their meaning. Of course they can have, he said you can have meaning through life, work, through love, uh, through activities and also through suffering. So it's something for people to consider if you're if you're planning to retire or if you have, have retired. What is it through volunteering or caring for others or whatever it is? 
or painting, playing the saxophone, whatever provides, it's an, it's an individualized thing completely. Thank you. That's a, a great question. Thank you very much. Well, the, uh, what will gene therapy do to our interactions with aging? So it's going to be, gene therapy is going to be very valuable, and exactly how valuable is, is not clear, because there are new methods uh, involving some technique called CRISPR where you can actually change human genes. Where that's going, Levi might comment, but I, don't, I really don't know. But uh, what's neat is uh, genes don't work alone. Genes almost always are interacting with what we do. So one thing is most of our genes are bacterial. So if we want to think about genes, we should think about what we're eating because we can affect change our genes by we can change our uh, bacteria, bacterial genes by changing our diet. And Uh, if we change our activities, we control our genes. We control how our genes work. So the gene is only a code. It doesn't explain how it's working. And the word for that is expression. So if, if you break your arm and your arm is in a cast, uh, your muscles will atrophy. Nothing's happened to the muscle, to the genes. They're not being used, so they don't, doesn't work. And then when the cast comes off and you use it again, it comes back even though the genes stay the same. So I believe in science and many environments we're too obsessed with genes. We, the genes are not the only thing. Also, Alzheimer's genes are related to risk, but they don't, the most important ones are not causative, they're risk factors. So we still have an opportunity to intera interact, interact with these genes by doing the right thing. <laughs> yes, thank you. Studies show all the artificial sweeteners uh, have negative effects on the microbiota. Because they're, they're basically they're trying to trick metabolism, and it's not surprising that it has some uh, negative effects. So um, I suggest two things. First, that if you... Uh, well, one, one day at lunch in clinic, uh, actually at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in clinic, I hadn't eaten lunch. And then I, found, I just saw an apple, so I, I ate this apple. And I said to myself, this is the most delicious apple I've ever had. Well, how come, Who, where did this apple come from? And the only thing was, I was really, really hungry. <laughs> so if you don't allow yourself to ever get hungry, like if you, you're, you're, you're being a hunter-gatherer yourself, you're like s snacking all day, you don't get to be hungry. If you allow yourself to get hungry every now and then, you'll enjoy the food more, maybe even without sugar. So if you like, if you normally put sugar on your cereal in the morning, you can replace that with raisins, because raisins are sweet and they're high in fiber. Um, I've heard that, so like juicing or microwaving or different things might decrease the nutritional value of food. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's right. The, the microbiota community says, yes, the question, thank you. The question is what about juice? The, uh, the belief is that juice has no fiber. So the valuable part of fruit is the uh, antioxidants and so on, but also the fiber. So it's better to eat an orange than to drink orange juice. Orange juice is very high in sugar, and that's not good for you. So I stopped drinking orange juice about 10 years ago. So I have a question. So you talk so right now, kind of we have a yin and a yang of like medical advances increasing our ability to age, but now we also have more sedentary lifestyles and poorer diets. And so, 
how do we rectify, I mean, I, I, I keep thinking, like, I get everybody should be healthier, they should do more healthier things, but it's harder now, too, right? Because you can watch Seinfeld all day long <laughs> rather than go for a walk. And so how do you convince your patients to do these things, or can you? Well, it, it, it is really hard. But another thought experiment I like, I have, is imagine you're 80. I mean, it's not like you want to be 80, but you, you kind of hope that when you 80 years after your birth, you'll, you'll be around. Okay, a lot of 80-year-old people fall and they break their hip. And they go to the hospital, they get pneumonia, and they die. That is very common. You don't want that to happen. But it, it may happen, people fall, you, you read about people dying, famous people in the obi New York Times obituary, oh, he fell at home and then he died. So you don't want to fall, but of course, but fall, a fall may happen. You want to be resilient in the four ways I talked about, so that the, this person who died after the fall from pneumonia, she may have, he may have, or she may have died because the bacteria was a really bad one. Or it may be because the liver was damaged because of too much alcohol. Not enough to cause cirrhosis, but just to impair its function to make to destroy toxins provided by the bacteria. She may have died because she was depressed and malnourished, and she didn't have enough vitamin C and all the other vitamins, and she was frail. So you want to, be, you want to have a goal of fitness which will help you survive uh, negative events like that in the future. It matters what you do now. Yep. So what about the possibility of microbiome transplants from an elderly, healthy person into basically anybody else in order to set them on a different path? Thank you. Uh, this question is about microbiome transplants. So it's also called uh, fecal microbiota transplant. FMT, where they take a basically feces from one person and deliver it to another in different ways. And that has been found to be curative in some GI diseases, which had very high mortality except for this treatment. And it's being actively investigated even in uh, uh, motor neuron disease and ALS. And I don't know where it's, where it's going, but it is a very promising idea. And we are doing research about that in um, U of L in the laboratory of Dr. Badaluri doing microbiota transplants from Alzheimer patients into germ-free mice. And I should mention Joe Tackett is here from the development office of U of L if anyone is interested in supporting uh, the research of Levy and Levy and myself. Uh, I will make one more comment. It's not just microbiome transplants. Now you might have seen headlines recently of people doing blood transplants from young people into old people, young mice into old mice to like help rejuvenate uh, the body. So that's still, it's, it's, it's not there yet, but it's, there have been headlines recently. So question over here, yeah. Yes, thank you. The question is about how the microbiome, the bacteria in the gut, including the mouth, could affect the brain and could affect the anxiety and depression. And that is a very uh, interesting possibility which is getting a lot of attention. Particularly, there's a company named Axial in Boston which is doing microbial therapies for autism. And some of their preliminary work is promising, although it's hard to know if a mouse it has a model of autism or not. And uh, uh, this will certainly turn out to be important. And just a little bit of um, neuroscience. It turns out the most important immune cell in the brain is the, micro, is the microglia. And that's uh, just like a white blood cell, but it's in the brain. The morphology, the structure and activity of these cells in the brain, and there are many more of these cells than neurons, is influenced by what you eat. So it's another reason to eat a lot of 
fruit and vegetables and basically plants and not red meat and um, not juice. Dr. Friedman can give an entire view on, but beer with the scientist, which he has before, on the microbiome affecting the brain. Uh, so we may have to have him back for a, an encore presentation of that. Could you ask Dr. 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 Sheck has a question? One last question. Uh, one, one more question. One more question, and then we gotta let everybody go. I'm sorry. There you go. Is there are a lot of probiotic pills available in the market, and we go to It's not clear. The question is if probiotics, which are live bacteria that you can buy in the store, if they're good. And the answer is we, we really don't know. It's not clear that they actually provide, become colonized. However, we can, we can do that, we can deal with that in one way by, by eating yogurt and by uh, having a diet which fosters the growth of certain uh, good bacteria. And another way is shown over here. Who has the dog? The research shows that children that grow up with a dog have a better immune system. The title of the book that discusses this is <laughs> Dirt is Good. All right, so one more thing before I let Dr. Friedland go. Uh, just to let you guys know, again, if you want a book, come on up. He'll be here for a while. Two, please take care of Olivia. Close out your tabs if you have tabs still open. Uh, thank you all. What's that? Thank you. If you have glasses, take them back in, drop them at the bar. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. See you guys next time.